Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And grace, mercy, and peace are yours, Bree, Colby, and Avian, from God our Father, and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The creation is dependent upon God. God is not dependent upon the creation. God did not create the creation in order to fulfill some kind of need in himself. God was just as complete before the creation as he was after the creation. God created the creation because it is in the nature of God to create. And once the creation exists, the creation is dependent upon him. The creation exists by the word of his power. It is the word of his power which he gave in the beginning. And as soon as he issued the word of his power, the creation existed. And the word of his power sustains that creation in existence ever since. You are there sitting on those pews. And I am here standing in this pulpit. Because the word of his power maintains our existence while you are there and I am here and you are listening to my voice. Not only does the word of his power sustain the creation in existence, God also sustains our existence within the orders of the creation that he created. In other words... He gives us clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, life and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He sustains not only you, he sustains the beasts. He sustains the plants. He provides you with your homes and your clothing. He is the one who makes your crops to bloom. He is the one who gives you a stable economy. He is the one who provides you with all of the luxuries of first world people. But then he also provides all of the luxuries of third world people. He provides all. We are dependent upon him. He is not dependent upon us. And things are worse now. Things are worse now than when he created. Things are worse now because the creation has fallen. Things are worse now because the creation is in rebellion against its creator. The creation is in rebellion against its creator because those who were in charge of the creation are in rebellion against the creator. In the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image and in accord with our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth. And so God made man in his image. In the image of God, he made him male and female. He made them. He commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And the purpose of mankind, reigning over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, was so to bless it. It was God's good order in the creation to impart his blessings to the creation through mankind. That is why he created us in his image. That is why he granted us authority over the creation. You cannot bless someone unless you have authority over them. And we are in rebellion against the creator. We have decided not to be dependent upon the creator. Even though we are dependent upon him, we are in rebellion against that reality. Mankind wants to be its own god. Mankind has seized the knowledge of good and evil and is attempting to use it to determine the way things ought to be. Mankind is deciding for itself what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil, what is helpful and what is cumbersome, and we are terrible at it. Because we were created to be dependent upon Him. And instead, we are trying to be independent and have everybody be dependent upon us. And this is true not only of humanity as a group. It is also true of each and every one of us as individuals. I think 
that I am my own God. And I am dependent upon no one else, only me. I will provide for myself. I will justify myself. I will forgive myself. I will provide all of the things that I need for myself. And I will decide for myself what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. Do you not understand the fundamental root of this rebellion against God? That we arrogant believe we can push him off of his throne and put ourselves in his place. This is the height of our sin. And we have inherited everlasting death because of it. I ask all the covenants before they are confirmed what they deserve because of their sin. And all of the covenants always answer hell. Most of them include death also, but hell is always in there somehow. Some of them say everlasting damnation, and some just say hell. And every time I ask them that, and every time they answer, my flesh sits there listening to their answer, and my flesh thinks to itself, wow, do such tender young people have to give such a terrible answer as that? And the answer is yes, they do. It is my flesh that wants to believe that they are innocent. It is my flesh that wants to believe that they're tender and they don't deserve these things. Not because my flesh loves the covenants, but because my flesh wants to believe that it is innocent also. If they are innocent, there's a chance for me being innocent so that I can be my own savior and justify myself before the world. And since the depth, of our, the depth of our sin is hidden from us in this fashion, God must reveal it to us. And this he does in his holy law, written in his holy word. The confession of the covenants is right. We deserve it. Death and hell. If God were to cast us all into hell, there would be no one there to tell him he had done wrong. And even if there was somebody there to tell him that, the person would not be able to tell it because God would be acting according to his righteousness. And so it is in accord with the righteousness of God that he says, I have compassion on whom I have compassion, and I harden whom I harden. He can harden Pharaoh. He can harden Sihon, king of the Amorites. He can harden Esau. He can harden any one of us right into unbelief and damnation because we deserve it. His righteousness, his holiness, and his justice requires it. This is God. This is the God who did not consider equality with God a thing to hold on to. This independent God upon whom the creation is dependent is the one who did not consider equality with God a thing to be hung on to, but he emptied himself. And he took on two forms. The form of a man and the form of a slave. The translations hide this fact. But the form of God and the form of man are two different forms because the forms are not compatible with each other. Man is dependent upon God, not God on man. And in spite of the fact that the forms are not compatible with each other, Jesus perfectly unites them in his own person. He is God and man in one person. So it was right last night when he answered me to that the two natures of Jesus are human and divine. He is the God-man, the Theanthropos. And Jesus does not switch back and forth between the two. He doesn't do some things as God and then do other things as man. He does not say, I think I'll be God today. And then the next day he thinks, I'll be man today. He is always God and always man, perfectly united in his person. And since he will not 
divide his person, his person cannot be divided. The example that I gave a few Sundays ago, a few Wednesdays ago, was Jesus standing on the bow of the boat, commanding the wind and the waves. He's a man standing there on the bow of the boat, and with his tongue, and with his teeth, and with his larynx, and with his lungs, he commands the wind and the waves, and they obey him. The one whom the wind and the waves obeyed was just a few moments ago asleep in the boat and the disciples had to wake him up. He is God and man all the time. In John chapter 12, our Lord says that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all people unto himself. And in John's Gospel, when Jesus talks about being lifted up, he is talking about being lifted up in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness on a pole. And so when Jesus talks about being lifted up, he is talking about being lifted up on a pole. And when Jesus is lifted up on that pole, hanging there, bleeding and dying, that is when he draws all men unto himself. He draws all people unto himself by his cross because on his cross he is providing for the salvation of the whole world. He is providing forgiveness for the rebellion of mankind. He is taking our rebellion, our filth, our uncleanness, our sin, and our death onto himself and he dies. And then he bestows upon us his righteousness, his innocence, his blessedness. He bestows upon us his resurrection and his everlasting life with God. <coughs> he has solved the problem of our rebellion and put us once again at peace with God. So that God in his justice forgives us and declares us righteous and receives us into his presence. And so the whole world owes him obedience. The whole world owes him fealty and loyalty. The whole world owes him endless singing and praise and joy. That's what he means when he says, draw all men unto himself. And so precisely when Jesus is the most human when he dies, is precisely the moment when he is the most divine. He draws all people unto himself. This is your God. Now, let's talk about the form in the book of Philippians that is compatible with God. And it surprised me to read it. So man is not compatible with God, so Jesus makes them compatible by uniting them in his person. The form that is compatible with God is the form of a slave. The translation says servant, I know that. But the original says slave. The one true God is a slave. He serves you not according to your whim or your desires. He serves you according to your need. But in his service to you, according to your need, he is your slave and will be obedient unto your need, even when such obedience requires his death, even when such obedience requires death upon a cross. He will obey it all according to your need. He is your slave. Jesus himself asserts this. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's another way of saying the Son of Man did not come to have slaves. He came to be a slave and to give his life as a ransom for many. On the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he stripped off his clothes. And so that he would have a little bit of modesty before his disciples, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and he washed these rebellious, arrogant, stinking, sinful, unclean disciples. And Peter objects, because this does not seem right to him. Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. 
And the Lord says, unless I wash you, unless I am your servant, your slave, you have no part in me. It is right to say that our God is a consuming fire. It is right to say that in his judgment and in his righteousness and holiness, his fires should consume us all. Our God is a consuming fire. And this is the God in whose presence you stand at the sacrament of the altar. The book of Hebrews says that the body of Christ is the veil of the temple, meaning that the body of Christ is the veil that hides the presence of God upon the earth. Jesus' body is the presence of God upon the earth. That is why they mocked him and said, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. The temple was being destroyed when Jesus was crucified. The temple is the presence of God on earth. And Jesus raised his body in three days, thereby raising the temple. The body of Jesus is the presence of God on the earth. The book of Colossians says, In him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And so when you stand before his body in the sacrament of the altar, you are standing before your God who is a consuming fire. And by all rights, standing in the presence of the holy God should have his fire consume us as it did Nadab and Abihu. But in the sacrament of the altar, God is your slave. And he is there to serve you. And so instead of him consuming you, you consume him. And he gives you his holiness, his righteousness, his innocence, and his blessedness. Amy and Colby agree this is the service of God. This is God's service to you. A service to which you are now welcomed and admitted. The only true God is the one who serves you. Any other God is not the one true God. And he has served you in an obedience that was even unto death, even to death upon the cross. And it is because of this obedience that God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now that kind of glory ought to have been his by right, because he is God. But he is the God who did not consider equality with God a thing to be hung on to. And so he emptied himself, took the form of a slave, and became obedient unto death. And it is because of his obedience unto death upon that cross that he is exalted. It is because of the salvation that that obedience has rendered to you that you bow the knee and speak with the tongue a confession of praise to God. The exaltation of our Lord Jesus Christ is His by right because of His humiliation. His slavery is what gives Him His glory. Now here's the word of command. Philippians has one word of command for you. This same mind or thinking or thought that was in Christ Jesus, that he would do all of those things, shall be the same mind, thought, and thinking in you. If he is your slave and serves you unto salvation, then you are to be one another's slaves, and to serve one another for one another's good. You are to be a slave and servant to your fellow members of the congregation and serve them not according to their whim or their desire, but according to their good. And be obedient to such slavery for their good. Looking not only to your own interests, but also to the interests 
of others. And as your Lord Jesus Christ placed your need above his own, so you place your neighbor's need, your fellow congregation member's need, above your own. And if you are willing, unwilling, if you are unwilling to commit to such slavery, then I must ask you, just who exactly do you think that you are? In the name of Jesus, amen.